Well, one of the most famous lines from the movies is that life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. But I'm telling you, that's not true tonight when it comes to the preaching of Brother Dan Winkler. You know what you're going to get. You're going to get passion. You're going to get investigation. You're going to get application. You're going to get a little bit of, of the emphasis on the original language, most likely. You're going to get a faithful proclamation of the word and uh, something that will really stick with you. That's why we have so many folks here tonight. They know what they're going to get. They want to hear more of it. Brother Winkler is celebrating 50 years of preaching now, I believe, and uh, started in 1969, at least as far as regular uh, preaching is concerned, authored a number of books but the, I just want to get to the point where we can hear him expound on the Word of God. And so his message tonight is entitled, Proper Perspective Leads to Purity. It's a privilege to hear Brother Dan Winkler. Good evening. It is a joy to be with you tonight. As it has been, I tried to do the calculation. I went to my bookshelves and went to all of those wonderful lectureship books, and I believe that this is the 11th year that we have spent Monday nights together at this great lectureship series. I feel so very blessed to be here again tonight, to be embraced by your love, your smiles, and to have the opportunity to open God's Word and study together. I would like to begin on a personal note. Last year, during the uh, series of lectures, I had to leave early on Tuesday morning. As will be the case again tomorrow, have to get back to Henderson, Tennessee, and uh, get back into the classes that we teach there at Free Hardeman University. But as a result of having to leave early last year, I was not here when the administration, the faculty, the elders of this wonderful church bestowed me with a wonderful honor of becoming an honorary alumnus of the, Miss, the uh, Memphis School of Preaching School. And I just wanted to pause for a moment and say thank you to all who are responsible for that. I received my diploma in the mail. <laughs> with it, I received my lapel pen. I have not worn this pin until tonight. This is the first time I've ever put it on my lapel. And I hope to wear it with great appreciation and honor from this day forward. One of the best things about receiving this diploma was I didn't have to take a single stinking Keith Mosier test. <laughs> and I graduated anyway. You can, <laughs> you'll have to take it away first. <laughs> I pray that I will wear this pen and this honor and bring nothing but respect to this school that is so deserving of the same. I regret that I couldn't be here with Brother Mike, who was also honored in that same way last year. And I so appreciate the wonderful work that he does at uh, GBN and in preaching God's Word on a regular basis. Thank you so very much. Tonight we start with a story. A little boy, due to an accident, lost one of his hands. The first day he was back to worship... And back in Bible school, the teacher was teaching a lesson on the church. So I'm going to ask you to do what that teacher asked her class to do. Are you ready? Get your hands together. Put them together. You remember the little story? Here's the church. Here's the steeple. Open up the church and what? There's the people. However, this little boy only had one hand. 
And so one of the fellow students, a little girl, observed, and she reached over, and with her hand, she put her hand in his hand, and she said, here, let's build the church together. That's what our lesson tonight is all about. When we think about the overall thing purer in heart and our assigned topic with its text, proper perspective. I believe that when we dive into the teachings of 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22, that passage is teaching us to have a specific perspective in life. And it is such a perspective that encourages us to build the church, but build it by togetherness. So let's spend some time with 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. If you would turn and let's read the passage to begin. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, unto unfeigned love of the brethren, love one another, or see that ye love one another, with a pure heart, fervently. Now what we propose to do tonight in our study of 1 Peter 1 verse 22 and our assigned topic, proper perspective, is two things. First, we're going to spend some time with an interpretation of this one verse. And I believe as we watch this verse unfold, one phrase or two at a time before us, we will see that it teaches us to build the church. And it teaches us that the way to build the church is by togetherness. And then once we have engaged in an interpretation of this one verse, we will step back and engage in an application of the same to our lives in the 21st century. So let's begin with this idea of perspective, proper perspective from 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. I believe that as we engage in an interpretation of this one passage, four words come to the forefront. In the reading of this passage, first of all, we see a condition, a blessed condition or state of existence. Second, we see an explanation as to why the condition was in existence. Third, we see a motivation that led to people engaging in what they needed to do for that condition. And then last of all, we see an admonition presented to the individuals that were in that state of existence. Now let's watch all four of those observations unfold before us. We begin with the word condition. Our passage begins by saying, seeing you have purified your souls. Now let's pause right there and break down that phrase. We're going to do so as it occurs in reverse order. The verse in reverse. First of all, I find you have purified your souls, your psuche. Literally, we would say your psyche. That's not talking about the psyche of man, the psychology of man. That's actually the Greek word for a part of the dichotomous nature of man. You might remember in First or Second Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18, the Apostle Paul says, We faint not, for though our outward man perishes, yet our inward man is renewed day by day. 
He bore reference to the dual nature of man in that one verse. There's the outward man, that's the body. In converse to the inward man, that's the psuche, the spirit, the soul. The outward man, the body, is perishing. I believe the New King James Version says decaying. If you don't believe it, look in the mirror in the morning. The inward man is being renewed day by day. Verse 18 says, We look not on the things which are seen, the outward man, the body, but on things which are not seen, the inward man, the soul. For the things which are seen, the outward man, the body, are temporal, but the things which are not seen, the inward man, the soul, are eternal. Here is this outward man, the body. It is what we see. It is decaying. It is temporal. But there's another part of mankind, man, woman. There's the inner self, as the English Standard Version calls it. There's the spirit, the soul. The inner man is that part of man that is not seen. That part of man that is being renewed and growing on a daily basis. That part of man that is eternal in nature, the spirit. Now when I turn to our passage of interest tonight, it begins by saying, seeing you have purified your stuke, your psyche, your spirit, your inner self. It's talking about the spiritual part of man. Our phrase of interest says, you have purified your souls. I know the Bible says, be holy, even as he who called you is holy. 1 Peter 1, verses 15 and 16. But the word that is translated purified in this passage is not the hagios, be holy. It's a very special word, in point of fact. If you took the time to go back to the book of Acts and went to Acts chapter 21, or you went to Acts chapter 28, you would read about the Apostle Paul purifying himself by engaging in what is known as the Nazarite vow. He engaged in the Nazarite vow and engaged in a purifying same root word as found in our current phrase of interest. That encourages me to think about the Nazarite vow to better understand my passage. And if I go back to Numbers chapter 6, verses 1 to 20, I read about the Nazarite vow. And in point of fact, in those 20 verses, no less than 12 times I read the word separated or separation. Ladies and gentlemen, the Nazarite vow was a vow of separation. And that's the purification that is under consideration in our current phrase of interest. These individuals had purified themselves as people did in taking the Nazarite vow. In point of fact, these individuals had been separated spiritually speaking. They had been separated from their past with forgiveness. They had been separated from the world via sanctification. They were a purified, that is, separated people, spiritually speaking. They were not separated physically from their world. They still intermingled with their peers, but they were separated spiritually from the world in that their values, their religion, their character was guided by something other than the world's values and character. So I'm reading about a separated, spiritually separated people. It is also of interest in this first phrase of our passage that it says, you have purified your souls. Listen to me carefully. This is not something that was done to them in this passage. This was something they did to themselves and that's going to be of crucial interest as we watch the passage unfold so I'm reading about a group of people who had in the 
past of this writing separated themselves spiritually from their peers, their world. It might be of interest to us to recognize the fact you have purified translates something called a perfect participle, meaning something happened in the past of these people and the consequences of that continued to that very day. They had separated themselves from their world and from their past. And that state of separation with all of its consequences continued to this very moment. They were a spiritually separated people. It might help us if we remembered that we too are to be a people separated from our past and separated from our world. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, listen to me, same root word, whatsoever things are pure, think on these things. We are to think as a people who are spiritually separated from the world. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. Keep yourself separated. Keep yourself pure. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22 as well. Flee youthful lust. If you look at the context, the context is talking about a quarrelsome spirit. Don't be quarreling people flee that youthful lust with those who call upon the name of the Lord with a pure separated heart we are to be a people known for our being different now as the passage continues I've read about a state of condition a people who were separated spiritually from the world and from their past. Now our passage continues with an explanation of how that condition came to be. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit. So what does that phraseology mean? In obeying the truth through the Spirit. Once again, let's break down the phraseology in reverse. In so doing, I began by looking at the phrase and the words, the truth, jump off the page. Not just the truth. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth? No, this is the truth through the Spirit, a specific body of truth is being referenced. Listen carefully. Through the Spirit translates a grammatical construction, meaning by the agency of the Spirit. So here is the truth that came into existence by the agency of the Holy Spirit. What body of truth is a body of truth for which the Holy Spirit is responsible? John 17, 17, sanctify them in thy word, thy truth, thy word is truth. What's truth? The word of God is truth. If I go back to Psalm 119, 160, American Standard Version, English Standard Version, the sum, S-U-M, the sum of thy word is truth. You take what the Bible says about a subject. You take the sum, the totality of what the Bible says about a subject. And that is the truth about that subject, and that truth in the Bible came via the agency of the Holy Spirit. I'm reading in this passage about the Word of God. 
or as Paul calls it in 2 Timothy chapter 2, 15, the word of truth that came to be by the direct agency of the Holy Spirit's inspiration and revelation. But this passage, this phrase says, you have separated, you have purified yourselves, your souls, you have you have personally, spiritually separated yourself from your past and their world in obeying the Word of God that came from the Holy Spirit. These people obeyed the Word of God and obeying the Word of God resulted in their purified, spiritually separated status. The word translated obeyed is the, if we looked at the cognate verb, it would be hupakuo, akuo, acoustics, a listening, a hearing. It's prefaced by the preposition hupo, under. A listening or a hearing under is the word picture painted by the combination of those two terms, hupakuo. Here is a group of people that listened under the word of truth that came from the Holy Spirit. They allowed, they gave the attention of their lives. I want you to listen to how we said that. They gave the attention of their lives to the truth that came into existence by the revelation and inspiration of the Holy Spirit. They obeyed the gospel. Now, let's pause for just a moment. Sidebar interest. I look at this, pre this phrase a tad more closely. You have purified your souls in obeying the truth of the Spirit. In obeying translates a grammatical construction that gives us the idea of, listen to this, impersonal. Not personal, not direct impersonal agency. In contrast to Calvinism that teaches the Holy Spirit directly works on the alien sinner's heart. This passage says indirectly the Holy Spirit. Not directly, but indirectly, impersonally. The Holy Spirit using the word he reveals separated these people when they were willing to give the attention of their lives to it. So the explanation is they were spiritually separated from their past and their world because they willingly gave the attention of their lives to the truth that had been revealed and inspired by the Holy Spirit. They obeyed the gospel and that's what separated them from their past and from their world. Now we find reference to that in other passages in verses like Acts 22 verse 16. Arise, be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Or in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26, which is a passage that says that God, or Jesus has sanctified the church, having cleansed it, cleansed it by the washing of water with the word. Or Titus chapter 3, verse 5, which talks about the washing of regeneration, the washing that results in a rebirth. I'm reading about baptism in every one of those passages it's the command to be baptized that results in I give the attention of my life to that specific command as revealed and inspired by the word of truth that coming from the Holy Spirit. And it's at that point in time that I'm separated from my past and separated from the world. 
the explanation for the condition. As I watch this passage continue to unfold, I read about the motivation behind these people's obedience. Why did they do what they did? Why? You have separated, you have purified your soul, separated yourself spiritually. In giving the attention of your life and obeying this body of truth, the Word of God, which is from the Holy Spirit, unto unfeigned love of the brethren. They did what they did, motivated by this phrase, unto unfeigned love of the brethren. Now, if you disconnected, it's time to plug back in. Looking at this phrase in reverse, first I read about love of the brethren. Philadelphia, philia, the Greek term for love, an emotional type love, the love of dear friendship. Philia, Philadelphia, Adelphos, brother, brethren, Adelphoi. Philadelphia is known as the city of what? Brotherly love. You ever visited Philadelphia? Why is it called that? <laughs> no offense to Philadelphia, but it's not because all the flyer children of the 60s migrated there. That's not why it's called the city of brotherly love. Why is it called that? That's what the word Philadelphia means. Love of brethren. It's a deep, loving friendship that brethren enjoy. The passage says, unto unfeigned love of the brethren. My New English Standard Version is a little bit easier to grasp. It says, unto sincere love of the brethren. I'm reading about a friendship a deep, loving friendship among brethren that is sincere. It is transparent and easy to see. This passage of interest says, Unto unfeigned love of the brethren. The word translated unto is that little three-letter preposition, ice, or perhaps you learned to translate it, ace. Always pointing forward in its emphasis. We have found that in Acts 2 verse 38 and dealt with it many, many years. Repent and be baptized unto ice, ace, in order to obtain the remission of your sins. You have purified your soul, separated yourselves spiritually from your past and the world. By giving the direction of your life to this body of truth, God's Word that came from the Spirit. And you did that. You did that. Are you listening? You did that in order to obtain the sincere love of the brethren. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm reading about a group of people here that were motivated to become Christians because of the love they saw in Christians. And I am encouraged and beg to ask, is that what motivates our peers to become Christians today? Are they moved to our front doors? Are they siphoned from their chair to our front pews? Do they cry, I want Jesus in my life? Because they see the love, the friendship that we share as brethren. Why aren't we baptizing as many as we once did? Because maybe we're just not showing as much friendship as we once did. You ever thought about that? The New Testament tells me 
to be a person that loves my brethren with deep friendship. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 9, As touching brotherly love, you need not that I write unto you. I read what some of my brethren write, and I can't say that about them. I turn to some of their blogs, some of their Facebook posts, and I can't say that about them. I hear what some of my brethren are saying about other brethren, and I can't say that about them. As touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you. Yes, some of us need that written to us today. For you yourselves are taught of God to agapao, love one another. So these people were motivated by that brotherly love. Hebrews 13.1 tells us, let brotherly love continue. And then of course, 1 Peter chapter, 2 Peter chapter 1, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge patience, to patience godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness. We are to be a people who have deep friendships and love for each other. And the world should be able to see that and moved to the gospel because they see that. Well, last of all in our passage of interest, there is an admonition to these people who had spiritually separated themselves from their past and their world by giving the attention of their lives to this body of truth, the word of God that came from the Holy Spirit, because they wanted this beautiful, loving friendship that brethren in the church enjoy. To these people, the Holy Spirit said through Peter, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. So let's look at that last phrase again in reverse order. The word that is translated fervently, if you were to engage in an etymology of the same, you would find that it leads you to a verb that means to stretch. It is prefaced by a preposition that means out. And it gives us the word picture of stretched out. As if you're running in a race, and as you're running the race, you are reaching, you're stretching back, so that the baton can be placed in your hand. At the same time, the runner behind you is stretching out to place the baton up in your hand. You're both stretching out, and that illustrates fervently in this passage. You are putting all that is you into this process. Love one another with a pure heart, literally out of a pure heart. Out of the very core of your heart, you are to stretch out to each other with love for one another. One another. One of the many one another passages of the New Testament. And it's prefaced by the word love, agapao, the cognate verb for that familiar noun agape. It's the love that wants what is best for the one that is loved. So to these people, the Holy Spirit says, you want what is best for one another. Out of the very core of your heart, stretch out with all that is you to make that happen. The admonition. And again, it's an admonition for another degree of love. So this passage is telling me that we can build the church even yet today with proper perspective. The proper perspective involves the right standard, the truth that has come from the Holy Spirit, but it also involves the right disposition. Love for each other. The world should see this beautiful friendship that's ours and want to obey that same standard, the gospel, that will separate them from their past and their world. That's how you build the church. That's the proper perspective of our passage. Now, the hard part begins. The application. This is the Memphis School of Preaching. 
many, many, many of us are gospel preachers or the wives of gospel preachers. And so the application of our passage tonight is going to be, be extremely narrow. We're going to talk about applying the principle of this passage to those of us who are blessed to preach the gospel. I want us to think about the word agape or agapao. And I want us to see the word pictures that are painted throughout the New Testament about love. And I want us to apply it to us as gospel preachers, starting from these shoes outward. In application of our passage, I would suggest, first of all, tonight, that love is a badge. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. Love is easy to see. Now, when I was growing up, they had cartoons. They were really cartoons. And in some of the cartoons, he had this guy and he was walking around and he had a sign that he was carrying. And there was a sign on the front and there was a sign on the back and they both read the same thing, eat at Joe's. And by looking at that sign, you knew that he was promoting something that Joe was selling, eat at Joe's. We are to wear a sign, and that sign should be easily seen. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, in that you agapao, love one another, even as I have loved you. Now, if I apply that to those of us that are gospel preachers, that means when we preach, brethren need to see what? They need to see our love. Do you remember what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 1 about his 1 Corinthian epistle? That was an epistle that spanked his brethren. He said, I wrote with much affection and many tears. So much love. I've heard men preach and they will say, now you know, brethren... You know, brethren, that I'm telling you this because I love you. Now, before we go any further, I want you to know that I love you, and that's why I'm about to tell you what I'm going to tell you. Let me tell you, if we have to say that we love people, we have missed Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14, speaking the truth in the sphere of love. People ought to be able to see it. In the words that we choose, the inflection of voice that we use, the heart that they transparently can see and sense. When we preach, others must see the love of God in His servant. It's a badge. Now, pause. Is that what your brethren have seen? Love is not only a badge, it is a blockade. In Nashville, where we worship frequently, they're doing a lot of construction. And there's this long sawhorse, and the top of it looks like a candy cane. And there's a big uh, sign that says, road closed. It's a blockade. You can't go down that path. You have to go some other direction. Love is a blockade. It keeps us from going down certain paths and treating people certain ways. And as gospel preachers, we need to know that. The love that we show people, the love of God, keeps us from going down certain paths and acting certain ways when we preach or even when we function as ministers throughout the week. Romans chapter 13 verse 10, 
I love the New King James translation. It says, love does no harm. Love does no harm. When my brethren pick up a poison pen and write different individuals' names on their yellow journalism, their yellow rags, and they try to destroy character, I want to shout, no, 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 love does no harm. It seems as though when we are given an assignment, we have to say what others think we should say. We have to say all that they think we should say. And we have to say it using the words they think we should use when we say what we say, or we are rendered suspect. And they talk about us rather than talk to us. And I want to remind us, love does no harm. When I can't wait to write something on the front page of my bulletin about a congregation nearby and what they're not doing or doing, love does no harm. The devil is using our convictions to cause division. He's using our convictions against us and we're letting him. Love does no harm. It is a blockade that says, no, I'm not going to blog that. No, I'm not going to write that. No, I'm not going to say that. No, I'm not going to treat this individual or that, that way. Love does no harm. I need to know that. As a gospel preacher. Amen? In the third place, love is a buffer. You ever gotten to your computer and turned to a great sermon and you look forward to uh, streaming that sermon? And so you're watching this sermon and the preacher is really shelling the corn. He's getting with it. And all of a sudden, he stops in mid-sentence and he just freezes. You ever notice, at least that, it seems like you always, when you freeze, it's always with the ugliest face you could possibly make. <laughs> but what's happened is, you pause and the computer is buffering. And the, singles, the signal's catching up. It's buffering. So you see that little wheel going around like this in the middle of your computer? That's buffering. Love does that. Love says, hold up. Before I act on my convictions, I take pause and I let my thought process and my, the, the, the heart of God catch up and dictate how I function. 1 Corinthians Chapter 16, 13 and 14. Watch ye, behave like men, be strong convictions. Next phrase, next verse. Let all that you do be done in love, affection. Conviction with affection. Conviction without affection creates the alt-right. Affection Without conviction, creates the alt-left. You must have conviction seasoned by affection. You must have affection governed by conviction. The balance buffers. And so, I stand for what is right, but I do it in the right way. There are two kinds of false teachers, brethren. There are those who teach falsehood they're false teachers but there are false teachers who teach the truth in ways other than the truth specifies and they're false not in their position but in their disposition both are equally devastating to the cause 
So love buffers and allows the heart to catch up with the head and join together in balance. But then, love is a boundary. When I was growing up in Fort Worth, Texas, we played football in the street. And the curbs were the out of bounds. And so we'd get down and we'd have everybody that going to go out for a pass. You go long, you go five and out, you go five and across, and, and you come down, you say, down, sit, and all of a sudden somebody says, hop, 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 whoop, whoop, car, and everybody, okay, we scoot over. Car drives by, you've done it, I'm sure you've done it. And the car passes by, and okay, you get down there, here, you're ready to go again. Ready, sit, hut, hut, and then if you're, if you're a tight end, or rather a split end, you run down, and you plant your foot and you come over and the quarterback throws it to you and you catch it and your feet are in the street and you catch it and you fall over into the grass and it's a completed pass because you caught it in bounds. The curbs are the boundaries and as long as you're inside the curbs, you're in bounds. The Bible teaches us that the curbs are love and we are to function inside the curbs inside the boundaries. If I turn to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God through Christ forgave you. And then verse 5 teaches us, listen carefully, be ye therefore followers, imitators of God as dear children, and walk in, there's the boundaries, in love. When I function as a gospel preacher, between the boundaries of love, that's what helps me be kind in my preaching to others. That's what helps me show a heart that is tender to others. That's what helps me be forgiving to others when they mistreat me as a preacher. You ever been mistreated as a preacher? <laughs> That's what helps me show people God. I am functioning inside the boundaries of love. Walk in love. Love, last, next, in the next last place, is a bond. A bond. Above all things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. The Greek word translated it means ligament. So when I was in, in the uh, 11th grade, junior in high school, on this particular play, I was not carrying the ball, but it, came, it fall, fell my lot to run defense for the left half back, and we're going around right end, and as we're going around right end, I'm looking for someone to block and open up the hole. But about that time, one of the opposing team hit me on the outside of my left leg below the knee. At the same time, another one of the opposing team hit me on the inside of the left knee, left leg above the knee, and my knee did this. And three ligaments were turned into spaghetti. I remember telling everybody in the locker room, see you on Monday, we're going to work through this. On Monday, I was recovering from surgery. And for the next three months, I had a hard cast from the hip to the toe. And I couldn't walk, and I had to rehab and come back the next year and enjoy a great season. But the point is, the leg wouldn't work. Because the band that joined the muscle to the bone was destroyed. The band that joins tender virtues to the heart of a Christian is the band of love. See if that's not what Colossians chapter 3, beginning with verse 12, actually says. Colossians chapter 3, beginning with verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, 
Even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity or agape love, which is the ligament, the bond of completion, perfectness. As a gospel preacher, if I'm having a hard time being merciful, if I'm struggling with kindness being heard in my voice, if I want to be somebody among the lords instead of do something for the Lord and I'm struggling with lowliness, humility of mind, if I'm not meek, that is gentle in my ways, if I'm not long in coming to anger but I have flashpoints, if I have that little black book and I'm keeping names of those that have hurt me, my problem is not I'm struggling with mercy. I'm struggling with kindness. I'm struggling with humility. I'm struggling with gentleness. I'm struggling with patience. I'm struggling with forgiveness. My problem is I need to love more because it's that love that joins these tender virtues to my heart. It's the bond. As a gospel preacher, I need to have those virtues in my life but they will be wanting if I don't want what is best for the ones that I'm serving and to whom I'm ministering. Last of all, love is a breastplate. Love is a breastplate. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 8 talks about the breastplate of faith and love. When others hurt me as a preacher, hey, when other preachers hurt me as a preacher, when other preachers hurt you as a preacher, when elders make decisions and they hurt you as a preacher or your family, when brethren misunderstand you and mistreat you as a preacher, love is a breastplate. That mistreatment bounces right off of your heart. It doesn't make its way into your heart and your being. Love keeps it from penetrating, keeps it out there, and allows you to consider, continue to want what is best for those you serve. Bill Gaither, the lyricist, was reportedly asked... What are the greatest song lyrics ever written? And without hesitation, he said, Could we with ink the ocean fill, And were the skies of parchment made, Were every stalk on earth a quill, And every man a scribe by trade, To write the love of God above, Would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though it spanned from sky to sky. But the world will never know that love until they first see it in me and the way I treat you and the way you treat me. Jesus prayed that we might be one, John 17. That the world may know that you sent me and that you love them as you love me. The world will never see that love until they first see it in the togetherness that is required of us as gospel preachers, as brethren, as members of family. Here's the hand. Hey, let's build the church together. It just very well may be that tonight you reflect on your life as a preacher's wife, 
as a gospel preacher, as a brother or sister in Jesus, and you see that the heart of God has not been something readily observed in your life about what you've done, the way you've done it, the way you've talked, the way you've preached, the way you've treated others. And you need to make some changes. If you have hurt your brethren, go home and tell them so. If others know that you have, then to build the church together starts with this invitation being yours tonight as we stand together and as we sing. Yeah.